Welcome again, everyone. This is now the part two of our hemoglobin function discussion. Let's now talk about 2,3-BPG some more. As I have mentioned earlier, this is our next topic. 2,3-BPG stands for 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This is formerly known as 2,3-DPG or 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. This is actually a chemical found inside red blood cells, which is produced from the glucose metabolic pathway. And I am referring to glycolysis. Remember, even if red blood cells do not have the nucleus anymore, they are still able to perform this function for ATP. And 2,3-BPG is an intermediate of this glycolytic process. Okay, so the concentration of 2,3-BPG has an effect on the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin. And what is this effect? It is a decreasing effect. So when there is 2,3-BPG, there is a decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So let's say that this is your hemoglobin, the one in blue. When 2,3-BPG is present, 2,3-BPG is attached to the globin chain. So if 2,3-BPG is there, oxygen cannot bind. But in the absence of 2,3-BPG, this hemoglobin on the left side, so there's no more 2,3-BPG, oxygen can now bind to hemoglobin. So again, in the presence of 2,3-BPG, there is decreased affinity, so there is no oxygen. And in its absence, there is increased affinity to oxygen. When 2,3-DPG is present and no oxygen, we call that as deoxyhemoglobin. And when there is oxygen present in the hemoglobin, we call that as oxyhemoglobin. As mentioned earlier, the concentration of 2,3-BPG also has an effect on oxygen affinity. In the deoxygenated state, the hemoglobin is stabilized by the binding of 2,3-BPG in between the beta globin chains. This is now known as the T conformation, the tense conformation, or the TOT conformation. The formation of salt bridges in between the phosphates of 2,3-BPG further stabilizes the tetramer in the T conformation. When the hemoglobin is in the T form, it constrains the movement of the polypeptide chains, therefore having a decreased affinity to oxygen. So in short, when the hemoglobin is in T form, a 2,3-BPG is bound to both the beta chains of the hemoglobin. In this form, there is low oxygen affinity or the hemoglobin is resistant to oxygen binding. That is why 2,3-DPG is only found in the deoxygenated state of the hemoglobin. As hemoglobin binds oxygen molecules, a change in the conformation of the hemoglobin tetramer occurs. This releases the 2,3-BPG. When the hemoglobin tetramer is fully oxygenated, it then assumes the relaxed or the R state. This is the form with a high oxygen affinity. So in short, when the hemoglobin is in the R conformation, it is assumed to be in the relaxed state. And this is only seen in the oxygenated situation of the hemoglobin where there is the absence of 2,3-BPG. With the absence of 2,3-BPG, oxygen molecules can now bind uh, to hemoglobin easily giving it a high oxygen affinity. Let's try summarizing what we have learned so far. So this is a deoxygenated hemoglobin with a 2,3-BPG. Now this type of hemoglobin travels to the lungs where there is a high partial pressure of oxygen. This is the tense form and it is a stabilized hemoglobin because of the 2,3-DPG. Now, because of this, there is low oxygen affinity of hemoglobin because of the presence of the 
0.23 BPG. But what happens now, since there is high concentration of oxygen, oxygen starts to bind to one hemoglobin that causes a conformational change on the globin structure. Now, this signals the cooperative binding of the heme portions of the hemoglobin. Now, as one oxygen binds, it makes it easier for the rest or for the succeeding oxygen molecules to bind to the hemoglobin. So there is a progressive binding of oxygen. Now, there would be a 15 degree rotation that would cause a continuous disruption of the salt bridges as the oxygen binds that would cause the binding of the rest of the oxygen. Remember, 2,3-BPG is attached to the globin chains that is stabilized by the salt bridges. So now, this is now a oxygenated hemoglobin in the relaxed form or the R form. This type of hemoglobin has a high oxygen affinity. This type of hemoglobin then travels to the tissue and in the environment where there is a decreased oxygen tension, 2,3-BPG then attaches so that the oxygen can be released. Remember, in the presence of 2,3-BPG, there is a decreased affinity to oxygen, thereby delivering oxygen. It then turns back into the tense form, and this form will travel back to the lungs. It's now time to discuss the second function of hemoglobin, which is carbon dioxide transport. Hemoglobin is able to remove carbon dioxide from the different parts of the body or from the tissues and it transports it to the lungs so that it can be expired out of the body. Now the carbon dioxide binds to the terminal amino acid groups of the globin chains. I want you to remember that the heme portion binds with oxygen while the globin portion binds with carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is transported in different forms. Unlike oxygen, which 97% is transported through the hemoglobin and only 3% is transported through plasma, carbon dioxide is a bit more complicated. So 70% of the carbon dioxide is carried in plasma in the form of a bicarbonate. 20% would be as erythrocyte bicarbonate. 5% will be bound to the globin chains of non-oxygenated hemoglobin. And the rest of the 5% of the total carbon dioxide will be transported in the solution. Let's now try to understand how carbon dioxide is transported. Now, generally, the carbon dioxide that has accumulated in the tissues is carried by the red blood cell going to the lungs so that it can be expired. But as we have mentioned earlier, there is a much more complicated process than this. So the first process is that when carbon dioxide enters the red blood cell, it binds with water and this forms carbonic acid. This process is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. Now carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. Now as bicarbonate is produced, it diffuses out of the red blood cell and into the plasma and this makes up the 70% of carbon dioxide that is carried in the form of plasma bicarbonate. As the bicarbonate in the plasma increases, chloride enters the red blood cell to maintain the pH or the electron neutrality of the red blood cell. And we call this as the chloride shift. Now, not all of the bicarbonate is taken out of the red blood cell. Some of it stays inside the red blood cell and that makes up the 20% of carbon dioxide carried as a red blood cell bicarbonate. The next process is when carbon dioxide enters the red blood cell and binds with oxyhemoglobin. 
Remember, red blood cell from the lungs going to the tissue is filled up with hemoglobin carrying oxygen. So when it gets to the tissue, carbon dioxide enters and binds with oxyhemoglobin. This binding will cause the production of carbaminohemoglobin, oxygen, and hydrogen. Now, this releases the oxygen. It causes the diffusion of the oxygen to be carried out of the cell and into the tissue. So when carbon dioxide binds with hemoglobin, it releases or dissociates the oxygen so that it can be released to the tissue. Another step is that carbon dioxide can directly bind with the globin portion of the hemoglobin, also producing carbaminohemoglobin. Now the two carbaminohemoglobin produced by these two processes are carried directly to the lungs and this makes up the 5% of the carbon dioxide carried in the globin chains of hemoglobin. And lastly, only some of the carbon dioxide is diffused inside the plasma as 5%, which is carbon dioxide transported in the solution. Now that we know how carbon dioxide is transported, let's now take a look at oxygen transport. So generally, oxygen from the lungs is carried by the red blood cell going to the different parts of the body. So the red blood cell transports the oxygen to the different types of tissues where oxygen is needed. But as we know, there is a much more complex process than that. So oxygen from the lungs binds with the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. And this binding will produce oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin, again, is hemoglobin that is bound to oxygen. Now this is transported to the different parts of the body. This type of oxygen makes up 95 to 97% being transported in the heme portion of hemoglobin. That makes only around 3 to 5% of the oxygen from the lungs diffusing in the plasma and is transported in a solution. So let's make a little bit more of a detail out of this. We now have to find out what happens with oxyhemoglobin when they get to the tissue. But before that, we have to take a recap about the carbon dioxide transport. So one process is that carbon dioxide binds with water, forms carbonic acid, produces hydrogen and bicarbonate and the bicarbonate is released in the plasma. Another process is that carbon dioxide binds with oxyhemoglobin, forms carbaminohemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin is hemoglobin bound to carbon dioxide, also produces hydrogen and oxygen. Now the important part in this is the hydrogen atoms that are formed in these two processes because these hydrogen atoms can also bind to oxyhemoglobin and once they bind to oxyhemoglobin they produce deoxyhemoglobin and oxygen. This oxygen is now released to the different parts of the body or to the tissues where it is needed. So oxygen is not only released in this process where carbon dioxide binds with oxyhemoglobin, the production of the hydrogen atoms in the two processes also helps in the dissociation of oxygen with oxyhemoglobin so that there can be a faster release of oxygen. There can be an immediate release of oxygen from the hemoglobin. And that is oxygen transport. We are now at our last topic, and this is Bohr effect and Haldane effect. Both of this describe how oxygen is affected by factors with its affinity to hemoglobin. Let us start with the Bohr effect. So with the Bohr effect, this is the relationship of oxygen and blood pH. So what happens when there is an increase in blood pH and what happens when there is a decrease in blood pH? So the Bohr effect is more effective under low pH. And when we say low pH, that means there is an increase in hydrogen 
ions. And an increase in hydrogen ions means there is a shift to the right in the dissociation curve. And a shift to the right means that there is a release of oxygen. This means that there is a decreased affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen. So a low pH means decreased affinity. In the metabolizing tissue where there is very low pH, so this is acidic because of all the acidic metabolites that are produced by the peripheral tissues, this will then favor the release of oxygen. And in the lungs where the pH is as it is at its highest, this will then favor the uptake of oxygen. What about Haldane effect? The Haldane effect is oxygen affinity with carbon dioxide. So what happens if the carbon dioxide increases or decreases? Now, this is more effective under an increased carbon dioxide concentration because when there is an increased CO2 in the dissociation curve, that is a shift to the right and that is the release of oxygen. This happens in the metabolizing tissue where there is an uptake of carbon dioxide. So there is an increased carbon dioxide in the red blood cell, thus releasing oxygen. And in the lungs where there is an uptake of oxygen, the carbon dioxide can then be released so that it can be expired. So that is Bohr effect and Haldane effect. just to help with the memorization about Bohr and Haldane effect. In Bohr effect, we can say that it has something to do with the relationship of oxygen and pH. And when I say pH, I am actually referring to the hydrogen ions that are increased or decreased because this can affect the release of oxygen to the tissues. Haldane effect, on the other hand, has something to do with carbon dioxide. And through the lungs, carbon dioxide exits the body or carbon dioxide is expired. That is it for Bohr and Haldane effect. And that is it for our hemoglobin function discussion. I hope you understand everything and I hope you learned a lot. Our next video discussion will be about the different abnormal hemoglobins. Thank you very much for watching.